Well, hello again, everyone, and welcome to worship. My name is Amanda Neppel, and we believe it's no accident that you're joining us for worship today because we have been praying for you. Speaking of prayer, we have a great opportunity for you. You can head out to lutheranchurchofhope.org slash prayer hyphen wall, and that's a great way for you to post any prayer requests that you have, as well as to head out there and pray for other people. Uh, And they get an email that then you've prayed for them, and so it's a really great way to be one church in multiple locations. Hope Kids, we want to be sure you know that there is a video for you after the service today. You can head over to our YouTube page to check that out. And as well, our website has many other ways that you can get connected for youth and for kids and everybody and adults as well. We are celebrating communion today near the end of the service, so now would be a great time to gather your wine or your grape juice uh, and some bread or crackers to participate in communion today. We are so glad that you're here. Worship is about to begin. Thank you for joining us and welcome to Hope. Good evening, Hope. Would you please stand and join us in worship today? Come on. Yes, we give you glory, we give you praise, God. All right, come on, let's sing this together now. When we sing this out. Our God. Our God is the light. The light of the truth. He's pouring the power. And fighting the battle. Every day I'm about before it. Our God is the land. The land that was slain. For the sins of the world. Thank you. 
Thank you so much for today, and thank you for this service that we have every single Sunday night at 5 o'clock. <laughs> God, you are so good, and um, yeah, we believe that. We believe that today and for the future, that there are miracles happening in your name, Jesus. You are mighty, and you are faithful. Thank you, God, for being who you are and doing what only you can do. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. 
This is Hope 360, your weekly look around Lutheran Church of Hope. I'm Mark Brandt. And I'm Haley Shepherds. Kairos, our weekly worship and fellowship for college-age adults, meets every Wednesday night at the Ames Auditorium and at Hope Elam across from the Drake campus, as well as online and in Iowa City. And it's been off to a great start this year. Come and join us, take a break from classes. You can join us for community, music, message, and a good time. You can join us either in person or you can check it out on our Facebook live stream. For more information on how you can get involved with Kairos, follow their social media pages on Instagram, YouTube, and Facebook. We are thrilled to announce a new opportunity for folks of all ages to break up their week with a Wednesday night worship service happening each week in both West Des Moines and Hope Elam. Come out on Wednesday to our community night, starting at five o'clock as we have a meal and interaction with each other, followed by instruction out of the word of God, followed by the intimacy of his presence. Come out on Wednesday, five o'clock to community night. And we're really excited on Wednesday nights. In addition to all the student activities that we have going on, we also have Wednesday night worship that happens at 6 p.m. in the chapel. It's a great time to come and worship midweek. In addition to that, before that at 5 p.m., there is a meal so you can come and eat and then come be filled up with worship at 6 p.m. in the chapel at West Des Moines. Hope offers a program in West Des Moines for teens to meet in a safe space to talk freely and to receive Christ-centered encouragement about current issues and challenges every Thursday night at Hope West Des Moines called The Landing. The Landing is another night of student programming on Thursday nights from 6.30 to 8.30 p.m. We meet in the well, and this program is designed for students 7th through 12th grade that just really want to talk about like what's going on in their lives, find healthy coping skills to cope with life, especially during the midst of a pandemic, and they also are able to see where God is in the midst of whatever they're going through. So if you have a student in 7th through 12th grade, regardless of what campus you're at, we would love to have them come hang out with us on a Thursday night. For more information on joining the landing or any of our Thursday night programs, visit the West Des Moines website under the care tab. Our men's ministry event, Wings and Things, this last Friday night was full of community, learning new tricks, heartfelt testimonies, and thousands of delicious wings like these that Pastor Andy saved for me. Why now, don't we wait until after Hope 360 okay. to eat these wings? Between plates of wings, and a message from Navy SEAL Chad Williams, Men of Hope got the chance to drive a big rig, learn to brew the perfect cup of coffee, blacksmithing, and more. And the following morning, Women of Hope gathered for an event learning to navigate some of life's transitions. A big thank you to all who joined us. And if you'd like more information on how to get involved in upcoming women's and men's ministry events, head to our website under the Grow tab. We are excited to kick off another all-church book study called Forgiving What You Can't Forget. It's a seven-week self-paced all-church course focusing on how to move on, make peace with painful memories, and create a life that is beautiful again. Register to receive class resources for this study, including online teaching videos and study guides, as well as search through the many other opportunities coming up this month by visiting lutheranchurchofhope.org slash classes. This week on Tuesday, October 5th, all HOPE members are invited to join us for a special congregational meeting to vote on two very exciting updates in HOPE Ankeny and HOPE Ames. Mm. That was your 360 degree look around Lutheran Church of HOPE. We're glad you joined us and welcome to HOPE. We are so good. <laughs> oh man. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to worship. My name is Amanda Neppel. I'm one of the pastors on staff here, and I just want to let you know that we believe it's no accident that you're joining us for worship today. We have been praying for you, and we believe that God is up to something powerful here in this room and for those of you joining us online as well. If you have any questions about anything happening here at Hope, I encourage you to check out our website. Uh, you can follow our social media pages. We've got a lot of information there as well. Uh, but don't hesitate to reach out if you want to know how to get connected, if you want to know how you can serve. We would love to join you and uh, connect you to whatever is going to work best for you and however you'd like to get connected. Our service at this time will continue with our Bible reading and Bible reading. And so I'll invite you to open your Bible, your Bible app. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 through 13. When you pray, don't be like the hypocrites who love to pray publicly on street corners and in the synagogues where everyone can see them. I tell you the truth, that is all the reward they will ever get. <clears throat> but when you pray, go away by yourself, shut the door behind you, and pray to your Father in private. Then your Father, who sees everything, will reward you. 
when you pray, don't babble on and on as people of other religions do. They think their prayers are answered merely by repeating their words again and again. Don't be like them, for your Father knows exactly what you need even before you ask him. Pray like this. Our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come soon. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today the food we need and forgive our sins as we have forgiven those who sin against us. And don't let us yield to temptation, but rescue us from the evil one. Here ends today's reading. I invite you now to join me in a word of prayer. Gracious God, Lord, we look to you on this beautiful uh, Sunday evening, God, and we say thank you for who you are. We thank you that you are a God who invites us into, into conversation with you, God. That you are a God who doesn't demand that we uh, use fancy words. You aren't a God who demands that we dress ourselves up. You aren't a God that, that insists that we uh, clean up our mess before we come to you, God, but that you just meet us exactly where you are that you know the cries of our heart, that you hear the celebrations of our heart, Lord, that, uh, that you just desire that we would, would know how close you are to us, that we, would, that we would dwell in that space with you because you have promised that you are with us. Lord, as we continue tonight, uh, we say yes to your presence here in this place. We say yes to what it is that you want to do in our hearts tonight, God. And we are so thankful and humbled and joyful, God, uh, that we get to gather with you here in this place and celebrate who you are and your love for the world that you created. We love you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray and everyone said, amen. At this time, our service will continue as we receive the offering. If you would like to contribute financially to the mission of Lutheran Church of Hope, you can do that. There's a green My Offering button on the website. There are also containers in the back of the room if you would like to leave your offering that way. Uh, but either way, we are going to continue with an offering of music. Welcome to Hope. We're glad you joined us tonight.
Greg, would you like to say Grace? Oh, uh, well, uh, Greg's Jewish dad, you know. You're telling me Jews don't pray, honey? Unless you have some objection. No, 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 uh, no, I'd love to. Pam, come on, it's not like I'm a rabbi or something. <laughs> I said Grace and many a dinner table. Oh, dear God, thank you. You are such a good God to us, a, a kind and gentle and accommodating God. And we thank you, oh, sweet, sweet Lord of hosts, for the smorgasbord you have so aptly lain at our table this day and each day by day day by day by day oh dear lord three things we pray to love thee more dearly to see thee more clearly to follow thee more nearly, day by day, by day. Amen. Amen. Oh, Greg, that was lovely. Thank you, Greg. That was interesting, too. <laughs> well, good, good evening and welcome to worship. So many of you have seen that clip uh, from Meet the Parents. Uh, one of the like hallmark clips, if you're going to talk about most uncomfortable situations ever, where uh, Greg is going to meet his uh, girlfriend, now fiance's parents, and, and they ask him to pray. And he has this idea that in order for him to be acceptable, there's a certain way he's got to do it. And there's a certain way he's got to say it. And there's a certain things that he needs to do in order for his prayer to be impressive or in order for him to count or for him, order to him to be somewhat that, someone that would be worthy of their daughter's hand in marriage. And so it just kind of gets derailed, doesn't it? My goodness. And chances are, if you're somebody who is not comfortable praying, if somebody asked you to pray, you'd say, absolutely not, because I don't want to be that guy. Like, I've spent my whole life not trying to be that person. Now I'd be fearful that I'd be that person, so I don't want to do it. And some of us, maybe, are kind of like Greg in the fact that we kind of want to make it a little bit of a show. It's not like he was doing it intentionally, but he was doing it to be impressive. And this is what Jesus is getting at in this portion of the Sermon on the Mount uh, that we're going through in the series called Say What? Where Jesus says these incredibly shocking statements. He says these things that when he says them, you kind of have to step back and stop and say like, what on earth is he saying? Because it doesn't seem to be, it doesn't seem to be congruent with his character. Or it doesn't seem to seem natural to who Jesus is and what he would normally do. And so when Jesus basically says, uh, when you pray, you know, close the door... We start to ask ourselves, say what? Like what, what, is, what, what is he actually trying to say? Well, Jesus is making an incredibly important point to the people who are following him. Because there is a way in which things were happening in the culture in which Jesus lived. And maybe there is a part of us that can identify with kind of the religious culture that was a part of Jesus' time. That there were people who when they would pray, they would make sure, when they would do any type of religious thing, they would make sure that they would get into the place where everybody would be able to see them. And when they would begin to pray or when they would begin to do what they were going to do, they were doing it with kind of one, one eye open and one eye closed to kind of see like, if I'm, if I'm saying this, is anybody watching? It's kind of like you, you see like in a junior high classroom. It's kind of like uh, one of the things that I used to say when I would do youth ministry where I'd have these junior high kids and junior high boys are like God's humbling act of, of, of life for us. Because I'd be with junior high kids and I'd think to myself, man, are you guys absolutely nuts? And they are. But there's these boys that would like act in a certain way and it was like if you were with them one-on-one, -on -one, they were fine. They were quite palatable. Like they were actually human beings that you'd want to spend some time with. But then you'd bring somebody else into the room. Namely, you'd bring, uh, prob most, most of the time, if you'd bring a girl in the room, all of a sudden these kids, they'd lose their mind. And they'd say things and they'd do things. And you'd think to yourself, do you actually think that that makes you cool? I remember looking at a kid one time and I said, hey, I got a hint. 
for you. You're trying to impress this girl, and everything you're doing is having the exact opposite effect of what you want it to have. So just shut your mouth. Like, if you want her to like you, stop doing what you're doing. If you want to be effective, stop doing what you're doing. And this is kind of what Jesus is saying to the religious culture of his day. He's saying to me, so you, 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 you have people who, he uses, uses the word hypocrites. Like you're, you're, you're trying to act as somebody that you actually aren't truly as a person. And you're trying to put on this performance, you're trying to put on this show in order for people to kind of like you more. Give you more credibility. Think that you're holier. Think that you're more religious. Think that you have a closer relationship with God. Matthew chapter 6, it says this in the, the message translation. I love how it, it reads. If you want to go to the next slide. It says, and when you, go, you come before God, don't turn it into a theatrical, theatrical production either. All these people making a regular show about their prayers. Hoping for stardom. Do you think God sits in a box seat? Is that what your goal is? Is your goal trying to impress God or is your goal trying... To connect to God. Because here's the thing when we're going to think about prayer. And this is the thing that Jesus is saying when he's saying, hey, when you pray, close the door. Do it privately. It's not that Jesus is saying that you should never pray publicly. It's not that Jesus has anything against praying as a community. In fact, it seems as if that is something that's very integral to Jesus, to his life, to his life with his disciples. But Jesus is saying when you make it all about you. You miss the point. Prayer is not a performance, which is a really good thing. And there's something that, that, that's deeper to prayer. But I think some of us, we, we miss the power of prayer because I think there's something about prayer that kind of intimidates us. We say, prayer? I, 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 don't, I, don't, I, I don't really know how to pray. I really don't know what, what, what to pray for. I, I, I think when, when, when I pray, I, I feel like I'm distracted. I feel like I'm missing the mark. I feel like I'm not saying the right words. I hear all these other people pray, and they seem to do it in such a way that it just comes so naturally. And when I do it, I feel like I'm trying to talk to like a kindergartner. Or I'm trying to, to put words together that I would never use in my normal language. But I know that prayer is important. I know that there's something about prayer that seems to be a discipline that would be important to my life. In fact, Pew Research, a couple, a couple years ago, they, they, they did this study and they, they asked thousands of people. And in the Pew Research study, they do groups of research on kind of the religiosity of the United States. Kind of get a, kind of a, the, take the temperature of it. And so they asked the question of people, like, do you pray? And, and in fact, 90% of people say that, that prayer was a part of their life at some point in time. But then the question went a little bit further and to say, do, do you, how often do you pray? And 40% and of Americans said that they prayed every day. And then as the research went on, one of the questions was, is if... If you are somebody who says, I, I, I want prayer to be a part of my life, but I only pray, only 48% of people pray uh, every day, in that gap of people, what's the biggest reason why you don't pray? And, and many people say that they don't, they don't know how. Or they're scared that they're going to do it wrong. And here's the thing, just before we get started. There is absolutely nothing you can do in your prayers to get it wrong. Because more simple than any other explanation that you're ever going to get, prayer is like having a conversation with a person that you know that loves you more than anybody else in the world. I think sometimes we look at prayer and we have like these ideas of what prayer is. Like we think about prayer and prayer is just something I do when I want to I get something. So prayer isn't something that I would do only when I'm in a place where I have some sort of a need. So I kind of have it on the back burner. And it's not to say that when we, we, we need something that we shouldn't pray. My goodness, yes, we should pray. But we shouldn't just pray when, we, when, when we're trying to get something. I think about it from the standpoint of uh, when 1998, I was just, uh, I was a junior in college. And it was the best year the Minnesota Vikings have had as a football team in my lifetime. They were extraordinary. They were the best uh, team on the planet that year. And they had the, a guy who was a receiver. His name was Chris Carter. And Chris Carter, incredible guy, an incredible receiver. 
They said that all he did was catch touchdowns. He, he was able to catch balls in such a way that nobody else could catch him. And I remember an interview that, that Chris Carter gave and somebody asked him the question, like, how do you catch so many balls? Like, what's your secret? Like, is it your speed? Is it the way that you run routes? Is it the way you time your jumps? And, and I remember Chris Carter said, you know, here's what I do. And everyone was like waiting with bated breath. Here's how I catch all these passes. Here's how I catch all these touchdowns. He said, yeah, when, when, when Randall Cunningham, who was the quarterback at the time, when Randall throws the ball in the air, all I do is I just pray. And I thought to myself, my goodness, what happens if your defensive back is a Christian too? Like if it's just about you wanting something, what happens if the person who's uh, opposite you is, is praying something exactly different? Like is it something that, I mean I'm not saying that if you're in a place where you want something that you shouldn't pray. I mean, good night, my goodness. That's good that Chris Carter is saying, dear Jesus, let me catch this ball. But I think that prayer is most, most necessarily more than just that. Maybe we say it's not when I want to get something, maybe it's when I want to get out of something. Like it's when I want relief or when I want rescue. Which is most importantly, it's a very good thing to do. Most definitely yes. I mean you go through the book of Psalms, the book of prayers, the prayers. And a lot of the Psalms, a huge portion of the Psalms are, are the psalmist writing about a situation where they're fearing, feeling overwhelmed or overcome. And they're, they're wanting to try to, to find rescue from the situation in which they find themselves. Sometimes I, I think when we just treat prayer as something that helps us to get out of a, a, a situation that's not desirable, I think it kind of will limit the way in which we look at, look at God. When we do that, I think we, we almost seem like God's a genie in a bottle. And so, so like when I want something, I want to get out of something, we just kind of, we make our wish and we see if the, if the genie is going to grant us the wish that we want. And, and in fact, prayer is something that's way more than that. Sometimes I think we, we, we think that prayer is just some sort of a, a rote ritual that we do when uh, we kind of go through sit, certain times and certain uh, seasons in our life. Like here are the times that we pray and we ask, well, why do you pray? And we're like, no, that's just, that's just what we always do. Like w w before you eat, you, you just pray. And you say, well, why? And you're like, I don't know. We, ju we just pray. Or before you go to bed, you, you, you pray. And you people ask why. And you're like, I, I don't know. I just, I've always prayed. Now, I want to be very cautious about this because I don't want to minimize this at all. We're a family that at dinner time, at bedtime, we, we, we pray with our kids and there are aspects of those prayers where we pray the same thing every single day. And it's not because we're not creative. But there's a fact that, that, that it's in this kind of this routine that we want to ingrain it into our kids' minds so much that when they get to a place where they're beyond themselves, they have something that will kind of come naturally. I think about my grandma, my, my dad's mom. She uh, went through the, the battle with Alzheimer's. She got it, I think, when she was about 85 years old. My grandma lived until she was 97. She had a, she had a great life. She was incredibly strong. She was independent. Her husband had died. My grandpa had died years before that. But one of the things that was so difficult is that when she started with her Alzheimer's, it started as just kind of like this just general forgetfulness. And then after some time passed it, then it went to uh, kind of, some, it almost felt like anxiousness or, or kind of almost some, some anger sometimes, not lashing out, but unsettled more. And then it got to a point where it really started to really impede and impact not just her daily life, but, but, but the way in which she was able to interact with you. I remember the time and the season when she didn't recognize us anymore. Grew up in the same city, in the same area as my grandma. And I remember when, when she, she couldn't recall my name. I'll never forget that. My dad would, would, would go and he was the only one of her three uh, children who still lived in the area. And he'd go and he'd spend all of this time with her. And I remember uh, about the time when my dad came home after he visited his own mom and talked about the fact that he, she, she couldn't recall him, remember, couldn't place his name. And one of the things that I'll never forget, and as long as I live, that when she had forgotten everything else, there were two prayers that she did not 
ever forget. She could say the table grace in Norwegian, the language that she spoke when she was a child. And she could just go into that without even thinking about it. She could, she could pray the Lord's Prayer in Norwegian. And so I don't want to somehow say that the, the, the ritual, the routine of prayer is a bad thing. I think it's a, an incredibly life-giving thing. It's an important thing and there's power in it. That's why we're going to talk about this prayer that Jesus teaches us. But it's not the prayer that becomes the, the end goal. It's what Jesus is saying when he says, hey, when you pray, when you go through your prayers, pray like this. Jesus isn't just telling us, hey, here's the words that you have to say in order to get it right. Jesus is saying, let me give you a model. Let me give you a model for how you could construct your prayers. Here's the way that you identify your prayers and here's the way in which you, you place yourself in relationship with this God who loves you, who, who, who created you. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6, he says, when you pray, pray this way. He says, you pray our, our, our Father. It's not about a ritual. It's all about the relationship. I believe that one of the biggest challenges sometimes we come up against in our faith is we, we feel as if God or we feel as if Jesus or we feel as if, if faith is, is something that's abstract or it's something that's distant. And in this prayer Jesus is saying it's anything but. He says when you pray, you pray our Father who art in heaven. The God who created everything is one who's incredibly intimate. He's not distance. He's present. The word that Jesus uses in this phrase in the Lord's Prayer, the word for Father, it, the Aramaic of it, the, the ancient Hebrew of this, the, the word is Abba, and it means Dad, it means Daddy. It's this, it's this term of endearment, but, but it also, anybody who would hear this, Jesus was talking to people who were Jewish, and when the Jewish person would hear that, they would hear that the, the Father was the one who, who gave you your identity, who gave you Everything that you would ever need who would set you and put you on a path that would lead you to life. Jesus says when you pray, you, you pray to a God who is close. A God who is with you. A God who gives you identity. A God who, who cares for you. A God who wants to be with you. A God who wants to be in a relationship with you. A God who is not just in heaven but who is also holy but chooses to be in a relationship. God's not distant. Even when it feels like he is. God's not distant. Even if it feels as if maybe we're missing the mark. Or we're getting it wrong. Or we're not doing the right thing. This reminds us. Jesus reminds us. That it's not about our performance. It's about his person. It's about him. That he loved the world so much that he entered into it so he could, so that he could be with you. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed holy is your name. Jesus says, you're, you're, you pray that, that God, your kingdom would come on earth as it is in heaven. Now you think about it, this is an incredibly bold kind of prayer. To pray, God, let your kingdom come. Let your will be done on earth, here, where I am, as it is in heaven. Th this picture of the way that, that God had created the world and, and everything was good and everything was without incompletion. It was incredibly complete and everything was exactly the way that it should be. And God says, and Jesus says, when you pray, pray that that would be so. That that would be the reality. That, that, that God's kingdom would break into wherever it is that you are and whatever it is that you're going through. That his kingdom would come. That we set our hope in God's reality. Not in our current situation. We set our hope in God's goodness and his, his love for us. Jesus, one of the first things he says when he comes onto the scene, scene is he says, the kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom is coming. 
And when we pray, we pray that God's kingdom would break through. That into the darkness there would be light. Into the chaos that there would be order. Into the fractured there would be healing. Into the death that we would be able to find life. Jesus says, pray that, that you'd give us today our, our daily bread. Jesus wasn't just talking about a physical need. No, Jesus saying is, pray that God would give you everything that you need today. Emotionally, mentally, spiritually. give you the sustenance for your existence. He uses bread as an, an, as an analogy. He uses bread as, as a way to, to describe life. But he also uses bread because the a- aspect of daily bread was something that would be quite familiar to those who heard him say it that day. It was the Israelites that were leaving slavery in Egypt and they are going to the promised land. And a journey that should have taken them a couple weeks ends up taking them 40 years. And as they're out in the wilderness, they have nothing to eat. And so the people complain to Moses who cries out to God. And God says to Moses, Moses, each day I'm going to give you, I'm going to provide for you. I'm going to give you this thing called manna. It's like bread from heaven. And he says to Moses, Moses, don't take more than, you tell the people not to take more than they need for today. You, you, you don't need to hoard it, Moses. I'll, I'll give you more tomorrow. Moses, I'll give each person everything they need for every single day that they're on this journey. That I'm more than enough. That I will satisfy the needs that you have. That's what we're praying when we pray this part of the Lord's Prayer. God, give us today. Whatever it is that I need today, whatever it is that I need to sustain me, to fill me, to to allow me to to move through the life that you've called me to live, give that to me today. I don't think it takes any of us very much time at all to think, here's what my needs are. Not just what my wants are, but here's what my needs are. Here's where I need God's provision in my life. God, give that to me. See, this prayer is so much more than just so, some words that, that we, we, we recite together at the, at the right time, in the right space, during the right seasons. It's about a depth of, of our dependence on a God who, who loves us. Give us today our, our daily bread and, and here's the hard one. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. God, allow us to partner in the grace that you give us so freely. He didn't throw that in there to kind of try to trip you up in the middle. He didn't throw that in there to somehow say, well, I'm going to give you the good stuff first. And then in the middle, I'm going to throw something at you that's going to really trip you up. Jesus is saying, I know the things that hold you back from life. That have a way of of getting a hold of you. Of grabbing a hold of of, of your heart and of your mind. That prevents you from living. I read some some article a few weeks ago and it said that over 25% of people are living with some sort of unforgiven thing in their life. Like right now. And you think about how much that just becomes a thing that you can't let go. And we've got to make sure that we don't look at forgiveness as somehow some act of saying that what a person did to us was okay. That's not forgiveness. Doesn't mean that whatever uh, happened to us or somebody did to us or said to us, it doesn't mean that we somehow forget that it ever happened. That's not forgiveness. 
It's not saying that that person is going to be a person that we're going, to, we're going to go back into a relationship with. And so once we forgive that person, it means that that relationship is going to be exactly the way it was before whatever it is happened. Whatever it was that happened, happened. That's not what forgiveness is. What forgiveness literally means is it means that, that, that you're going to let it go. Like let it go meaning this thing doesn't get to be the thing that dictates how my day is going to go, how my week's going to go, how my year is going to go, how I'm going to interact with other people, how I'm going to receive people's love. That this thing that happened isn't going to be the thing that gets to be a God for me. I'm not going to worship that thing anymore. I'm not going to hold on to that thing somehow thinking that the angrier that I get, the better off I'm going to be. Jesus says, no, it's killing you. Let it go. Forgive us, God, the way that you have forgiven us. Let us bring our hurts and the places that we've been done wrong and let us bring them to the cross where you put our sin to death, where you took care of it. It wasn't easy. But it gives us life. If we could learn and to work and not to say that it's just snap your fingers and you just do it and then it's all gone. That's not the way it works. But I wonder what it would look like in your life if that one thing, if you're able to just say, you know what? I'm not going to try to hold that person captive any longer because that's not my job. And I'm going to let... <laughs> I'm going to let God be the one who's going to dictate what's going to happen in that person's life. Because my anger and my hurt, it's not giving me anything that's giving me life. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those. And lead us not into temptation. And deliver us from evil. God, protect us. Protect us from temptation. Protect us from evil. Protect us from those things that so quickly can derail us. Protect us from the, the, the darkness that, that can creep into our lives that can steal so much from us. Jesus says pray about it. Seek the protection that only God can give. Jesus says these things. Not because he's saying, you know what, if you fall into temptation, if you fall victim to evil, it means that you, 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 you're not in a relationship. He's saying, no. There is darkness in the world. There is evil in the world. There are things in this world that are not of God, that, that have a way of getting their hooks into us, that, that tend to, to, that to draw us in and, and make it so enticing. And we, we want it so badly because we think those things are going to be the things that give us life. And Jesus says, pray about it. Allow God to enter into that process. Allow God to enter into that place where you feel like temptation has just gotten a hold of you so greatly. Pray to God in those places where you know that the evil is just of the world is just circling you. It's this model of a prayer that's so beautiful that Jesus gives as a response to people's questions. There's two places in Scripture where Jesus uh, gives the Lord's Prayer. In Matthew's Gospel, he gives it in Matthew chapter 6, the Sermon on the Mount. In Luke's gospel, it comes out of a conversation where Jesus' disciples, they come and they ask him a question. So Jesus responds. He says, hey, Jesus, we, we, we see this about you and, 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 and teach us the same thing. There's a TV miniseries that has been happening. It's actually not TV. It's just a miniseries. You can find the episodes online. There's two seasons now. It's called The Chosen. And there's a part of it that, that is very much, it's, it's made up. It's based on scriptural stories. Uh, but there's a, a, some, some editorial liberties that are taken. 
basically focuses on different characters in, in Scripture and kind of fill, to, creatively fills in the gaps to what it would have looked like or what it would have sounded like or what are some of the other conversations that were taking place outside of Scripture. So I just want to make sure that anybody who, who sees this or also who watches The Chosen that you know that it's not, it's based on Scripture but it's not Scripture. And there are things about it that some places where I believe that they kind of get it wrong. But it's just, it's powerful, it's wonderful. But this scene of, it's Luke's portion of Jesus sharing the, the, ten, or the, the Lord's Prayer. That to me, the way they captured it was, seemed pretty, pretty spot on. Take a look. Rabbi, Philip said the baptizer gave his followers a prayer in addition to the daily traditional prayers. Perhaps you could do the same. Yes, I'd like to learn more about what you're saying when you're out alone. Now, now you're behaving like true students. This is what I like to see. And prayer is the first step in getting the mind and the heart right. It's why you see me go to it so often. So teach us to pray like you do. Please. When we pray, we want to be sure to first start with acknowledging our Father in heaven and his greatness. So you can say, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. And we always want to be sure to do God's will and not our own. So we say, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth. It's a prayer that we know so well, and so I want us to take just a moment, just a moment, and, and Jacob is going to, he's going to sing it over us. And as you hear this prayer, don't be tempted to sing along, don't be tempted to pray along, hear it, listen to it, receive it, the goodness of God for the goodness of you. Maybe sit back. Take a posture or a position that's comfortable. Close your eyes if you want to close your eyes. I can tell you that there are very few times where you're going to see a version of the Lord's Prayer sound as beautiful as about what you're about to hear right now. And let it be so. Let God's prayer for you restore your heart, your mind. Remind you of a God who desperately wants to not just to hear from you, but wants to talk to you. Wants to be in a conversation with you. So hear this, and then we'll, we'll wrap it up.
This prayer that Jesus teaches us, it's a model. It's not a mandate. It's not saying if you pray this way, it's better than any other prayer. It's a way for us to, to hear the heart of God. God who's our Father, who's holy, who's in heaven. Who gives us what we need. Who protects us from evil. Who doesn't lead us into temptation. Who delivers us from evil. Who offers us forgiveness and to, to be able to to allow that to be a part of our, our life. Who is a God who doesn't just hear our prayers, but he answers them. Did you know that? I think that's probably one of the most difficult aspects of prayer. So that's great, Jeremy. That's great. It's wonderful. Lord's Prayer, wonderful. Prayer, great. I understand it. It's awesome. I'm not going to argue with it. But I just wonder why he never answers. He does. Every time. We don't always see it. It doesn't always come on, on our timeline. It just doesn't. Trust me, I get it. I experience that. I go, God, where, where are you in this? God, when are you going to answer this? When, when, when are you going to respond in this? Jesus says, keep on asking. You, you, and you'll receive what you ask for. This is Jesus. The God that loved you so much that he entered into the world and he died on a cross for you. This is what he says to you. Keep on asking and you'll receive it. Keep on seeking and you'll find. Keep on knocking, the door will be open. He goes on, for everyone. Everybody say everyone. For everyone who asks, receives. Everyone who seeks, finds. And to everyone who knocks, the door, it'll be open. Why? Because he loves you. Because he's your father. Good father. I know that there are some of us who have a relationship with a father who that doesn't bring about a, a very confident feeling in our hearts and in our minds. It's different with God. I and mean, I'm sorry about that. It was a couple weeks ago, uh, our daughter Jade, she loves gymnastics. She's been involved in gymnastics for some years now. Last year at the end of the, their, their like kind of spring into summer session, she, on her very last uh, practice, there was one move that she had to, fig, uh, she had to complete in order to, to go from tumbling to advanced tumbling. And so the last day of practice, Bridget came home with Jade, the only one parent could go because that's the world we live in right now. And she came home and I said, so, did she, she pass? And, and Bridget said, yeah, she, she passed. They, they, they moved her to the next level and so she went to the next level. And so it was probably about four weeks ago, she went to her advanced tumbling class for the very first time. And it was about, I don't know, like... 30 minutes into the class, and I start getting these text messages from Bridget. And the first text message I got was just a, a crying face. And so I, like, I, I responded with question marks, like, huh? What the? She said, she clearly isn't ready for this class. She said, it's not going well at all. She needs to be able to do this back hand, handspring, and she just can't do it. So I responded, and I said, it, it'll, it'll be okay. I didn't know what else to say. I said, it'll be okay. Five minutes later, she's like, it's not getting better. Ten minutes later, she's like, my goodness, I just want to go into that room. She's like, I, as her mom, I can see the tears in her eyes, and I can't stand here when I know that she's hurting so badly. About five minutes later, Bridget says, she's like, I don't know if I can do this anymore. This is the hardest, and now, relatively speaking, but she's like, this is the hardest thing I could ever imagine is to watch her hurt and not be able to step in and to hug her and to tell her it's going to be okay. Like, I feel so distant right now. And so I called Bridget. I'm like, are you going to be okay? And she's like, I don't know. 
Jesus says, after he says, keep on asking and you'll get what you ask for. Keep on seeking and you'll find it. Keep on knocking and the door will be open to you. He says, and if you sinful people, if you, and he's not saying you awful people. He's saying, and you people who are just human beings, who aren't perfect, who miss the mark. If you know how to give good gifts to your children, if you know what it's like to see your child in need and to say, I would move heaven and earth to satisfy the need for my child. Like there is nothing that I wouldn't do to step in and make this okay for this girl that I love, Bridget was feeling in her heart. Like there was something inside of her that was just breaking because she was hurting. And Jesus says, if you would do that for her, how much more? How much more would your Father in heaven, who is perfect, who loves you, who moved heaven and earth for you, how much more would your Father in heaven give gifts to his children who ask? See, that's the part of prayer. He loves you. Just talk to him. Have a conversation. Form isn't what makes the prayer. It's your heart and saying, you, you want to ask the most beautiful people in the world to pray? Ask a five-year-old. Like, I'm serious. Because they just say, Jesus, please. God, help. How much does he want to hear? How much does he want to speak? How much... He wants you to know. <laughs> Metaphorically speaking, he's in that room watching you on that tumbling floor. And he broke through heaven to get onto that gym floor to pick you up. And that's the power and what we're going to experience with one another here in this meal. Is in this through faith. We encounter the God who loves us. So I invite you to get your communion packets out. If you're at home, you can grab some wine or some juice or some bread. And hear the words of Christ's promise to us. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus, he took bread and after giving thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to them to eat and he said, this is my body given for you. Take it and eat it and do it to remember me. You can do that right now. In the same way after they had eaten supper, he took the cup and after giving thanks, he gave it for them all to drink. And he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood and it's shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of your sins. Take it and drink it and do it to remember me. He's a good God who's a good father who broke through heaven to come to you to, to save you. So receive this blessing and you can stand up and then we're going to worship and then we'll go home. So please stand. Prayer partners are going to come and get into place. If you'd love to have prayer, we would love for you to come forward. Now may the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, may it strengthen you and keep you in his peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
we're children of God. How beautiful is that, church? Come on. Um, thank you for coming here and worshiping with us here at Hope. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, thank you so much for joining us for worship tonight. Such a powerful reminder about how the God who loves us so much calls us to be in relationship and in community with him. Uh, so hope as you head out into the week, lean into that truth that God wants to hear from you. We want to let you know that we will be back next week uh, here in person and online. So we would love to have you join us that way, uh, whichever way works best for you. And hope kids head out to the YouTube page. There's a video just for you. Thanks for worshiping with us. Bye-bye. Have a great week.